Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce to you again the crew of STS-5, the fifth flight of the Space Shuttle Columbia, and beginning at my right, uh, Vance Brand, Mission Commander, uh, Colonel Bob Overmeyer, United States Marine Corps pilot, and Mission Specialists, Dr. Bill Lenore and Dr. Joe Allen. And I'll uh, let Vance begin. Okay. Thank you, John. Good morning. This finds us uh, about 36 days before launch. Uh, we're very busy. I think uh, very uh, enthusi enthused about uh, the next 30 days uh, or 36 getting ready. Uh, obviously, there's a lot going on right now. We understand the, uh, the progress of the vehicle. Uh, Spaceship Columbia is, is good and it's check out and uh, uh, should be uh, ready with a, a lot, lot to spare when the time comes for launch. Our training, uh, I think, is going well. I think we're 99% of the way there. <clears throat> the, uh, the final 1% is, uh, is tuning up, uh, looking uh, into uh, a little more deeply into the uh, satellite deployments in the simulator, a little, uh, quite a bit of uh, practice yet with auto land, things like that. But uh, it's looking good. I, uh, I feel very fortunate to have a capable and energetic uh, group of guys here to fly with. I think uh, this morning uh, we'll just turn them loose, uh, let them talk to you briefly about some aspects of the mission which uh, they are more concerned with. Bob uh, will we'll talk about uh, progress of uh, getting the spaceship ready, a little bit about ascent, entry, uh, Bill will talk about satellite deployments, PAM deployments that is, and uh, Joe will discuss EVA. So with that, Bob. Well, thank you very much. Uh, just to reiterate what Vance said, we've been particularly pleased with uh, Columbia's progress through the Cape, through its uh, pad uh, OPF, VAB, and then to the pad flow. We had a very successful shuttle interface test on the 22nd of August. It was one of the fastest and cleanest ones that had ever been conducted at the, at the Cape, which starts to uh, show us the maturity of the system that we're getting to fly. Uh, on the 24th of September, we also had the terminal count demonstration test, which was uh, an excellent test and very, very few anomalies. And what anomalies we saw were very minor. So uh, basically, we see that the orbiter is uh, really coming along, and it's basically ready for us to go fly. The uh, preparations and training for ascent, again, is going very well. There are very few changes in ascent this time as compared to uh, the previous flights. So th if there's one area that has had very little change, that's the ascent. And our, our picture of ascent looks very similar to that of three, Flight 3 and Flight 4. We have a good number of orbit DTOs that we're going to be conducting, uh, detailed test objectives. Uh, of course, you all are aware of the two major ones of deploying the satellites and, of course, EVA. And Joe and Bill are going to talk to those. We have a, a number of thermal DTOs. This is the last flight that Columbia will have on board the development flight instrumentation with all of its uh, uh, thousands of uh, sensors and data points uh, pickup capability. And therefore, we're trying to clean up on this flight all of those DTOs that have been deferred from other flights or which we haven't been able to conduct at this time. Most of them are of thermal type. We are burning some engines, engine tests, restart tests, those type of, uh, of uh, tests that are going to be conducted. We also are doing one uh, thing that I th I'm pretty excited about, having worked at the Cape for a year and uh, understand their concerns about uh, turnaround flow, is that we're inaugurating on our flight a process of turning on a lot of redundant systems. And this should then allow us the back of, to test the backup systems, if you will, of uh, the fans, uh, evaporators, water systems, those kind of things. And it will allow us possibly to not have to test those systems on the ground on the next, pat uh, the next flow through. The idea being that if, it, if we demonstrate that that fan or that pump or that motor works on orbit, that we will not have to then retest it at the Cape, which will help us bring our pad flow time to a much shorter number in the future. For entry and, entry and training, it's going extremely well. We do have uh, a new guidance system that we're trying out uh, for the first time called optional TAME targeting, which uh, after we come through entry and into the TAME uh, area, the Mach 2.5, we will be looking at some different ways of uh, gliding to our landing 
in picking up the, uh, the landing. Not, a, not real large changes to what we've flown in the past, but a yet a new type guidance system in that area to uh, give us more capability in the future. The uh, Autoland DTO is going well. As Vance said, there's still some questions in our mind on uh, the simulation and the differences that we're seeing in some of our various simulators here, and that is being worked very diligently and very, uh, very strongly throughout all of NASA, and uh, there should be probably uh, decisions for coming very soon as to whether we are, in fact, going to take Autoland to touchdown on the lake bed as we plan. Right now, we are training to that, and we expect to be doing that. And then the last DTO of uh, aircraft type training is the max braking DTO at, at 140 knots after the nose is down on the, on the runway. Uh, Vance will be putting and uh, placing max pressure on the brakes, and we will be doing max braking tests from 140 to 80 knots to really give the braking system a test. Uh, that, in a nutshell, is where the orbiter is going and what we're doing with the orbiter besides the EVA and the PAM deploys. And I'll just pass it on to Bill here for PAM deploys, I guess. Okay, first let me just uh, bring you up to date as to where we as a crew of four are in our training for the uh, deployments. Uh, as you know, the STS-5 primary objective as the first operational flight is to deploy two commercial satellites. And that we have to keep remembering that that is our primary objective and really everything else that we do on orbit is secondary, uh, including the EVA that is so interesting and uh, arousing so much attention. And Joe will talk about that. We as a crew of four have done a lot of training and are very familiar with the uh, upper stages that we are going to launch, starting with, obviously, with paperwork. When the uh, payload assist module came through our shuttle avionics integration laboratory, which allows us to integrate all of the avionics and make sure that all the boxes talk to one another and the electronics works properly, we operated many of those sequences over in our building 16 here became familiar with the flight type hardware and the flight like software at that time and since then we have our shuttle mission simulator model in we're still trying to upgrade it to make it as correct as we can it reminds me a little bit of the Apollo lunar missions where while I was in the office I was a uh, very much a, a neophyte and tremendously impressed not so much with the lunar mission and the lunar landing itself but just the fact that we could build a simulator to simulate all that, I think that was a much tougher job than actually pulling off the mission. And we're running into some of that in our mission simulator now to where we do the best we can on paper. We build that model and then discover it doesn't work quite as uh, the same as the flight unit does. So then we have to get back and decide how to fix that. And we are getting some good training out of our mission simulator in that regard. And both Joe and I have uh, taken part in testing of the actual flight hardware at the Cape. As a matter of fact, we were there yesterday for an end-to-end -end test where the spacecraft itself uh, was powered on, was taking some data, and then was telemetering that through the payload assist module avionics, through a simulated orbiter, through the Mila tracking station, to a geosynchronous satellite, to Goddard, to a geosynchronous satellite, to Houston, and so on, until it finally wound up in the payload operations control center and that they could verify that they got the very data that they were supposed to get so that it was working as it should work in flight. Uh, that's pretty much where we are. We feel, as Vance said and Bob, that we're 99% of the way there in our training. We've got another month, five weeks to uh, polish that, to get a little bit better at it, to get more comfortable and more proficient. Uh, but in fact, I'd be comfortable to go tomorrow if that were the case. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm about to give myself a test. <laughs> I have a model, and if I can successfully explain to you how the deployment works, then I will proclaim I'm trained for flight. In the cargo bay, we have two of these, and these are the, the payload assist module is the McDonnell Douglas name for what NASA used to call the spinning solid upper stage. So we used to, and we always take the first letters and make alphabet soup out of it. So NASA used to call it a sus. And McDonnell Douglas calls it a PAM, and NASA agreed some time ago that we would also call it a PAM, which is Payload Assist Module, which is a fancy name for a spinning solid rocket that comes out of the cargo bay and launches satellites to, uh, to higher orbits. We have two of these cradles in the cargo bay. The forward one is for the satellite business systems, and the aft one is for the tele. The forward one is about in the middle of the cargo bay, 
and then the aft one is right behind that. Right behind that is the developmental flight instrumentation, and behind that is the aft bulkhead with the Ohms uh, engines on it. In our sequence, we will launch with the sunshield open and the cargo orbiter cargo bay doors closed over the top of it. Just after we get to orbit, we will open the cargo bay doors, Bob will, and then I will close the sunshield over it. And it doesn't need much explanation. The sunshield title is enough. It keeps the sun off of the uh, off of the spacecraft. We don't launch with it closed because it interferes with the cargo bay doors. So. That's all we do post-insertion. Later on in the first day, we get ready to launch the SBS satellite. We will, first off, we will power it up. We will verify that its computer equipment and sequencing equipment is working correctly. We will check the backup system first, then the prime system, and get everything verified that it's uh, performing properly. At about 40 minutes prior to the deployment, Bob will maneuver the spacecraft at to the deploy attitude. And basically, that will be so that when we get to deploy time going around the world, the cargo bay will be pointing aft, and we will largely be nose out of plane. So if we were going this way around the Earth, if that's the nose of an orbiter, we would be doing this. <laughs> Tie my hands behind my back and I can't talk. <laughs> About 20 minutes prior, we begin what the sequence calls mechanical sequence. And the first thing that happens there is something that you can't see, and that is that the internal restraints that hold the spacecraft firmly fixed to the, uh, to the cradle for the launch loads are withdrawn. And they take 50 seconds aside, first the starboard and then the port. And we'll get notification that that's occurring uh, in the cockpit on the cathode ray tubes and on our panel. Then the sun shield will open, and we'll be able to watch this you will delay time because we're going to take TV pictures and a movie picture of that happening. And at that point, the spacecraft spins up. The spacecraft itself is spin stabilized. It is built to require spin so that the thermal uh, aspects of the spacecraft require it to be spinning if it's in sunlight. So it'll sit in spin at 50 revolutions per minute, which I can't simulate here. And then at about 15 minutes prior to deployment, we power up the spacecraft itself. So far, we've only been talking to the payload assist module, the rocket ship part itself. And at 15 minutes, we power up the spacecraft. And that's what you see here. That's the business end of the communication satellite. Uh, I didn't mention it, but both SBS and Telesat are essentially identical. They use them for different uh, applications, but the spacecraft is essentially identical. So we'll power up the spacecraft, check it out, and at 10 minutes, we'll put it, it on its internal batteries. Then, by and large, we've got seven minutes to spare, where not much happens until we go into terminal sequence. If we have any anomalies or any funnies going on, that's more than adequate, we feel, to uh, assess what our situation is and get reconfigured. At three minutes, the orbiter's computer sends the PAM system's computer a message that says, start terminal sequence. And from then on, the the PAM sequencer sequences through the ordnance and gets it ready to deploy from the orbiter. It's still spinning throughout all of this. The perigee kick solid motor and the apogee kick solid motor ordnance is enabled by either Joe or myself, depending on which one we're talking about. And the deploy ordnance is also armed. And at uh, five seconds, the sequencer from the PAM arms the deploy bus. And at time t equal to zero, the orbiter computer sends the fire command to the sequencer, which passes it on. If I get it, oh, wrong. Maybe I'm not trained. <laughs> well, that, there it is. And this will come spinning out at 50 revolutions per minute. We don't need this anymore. Pretty much as we see it here, and it ought to really be quite a sight as we see it leaving the cargo bay, and we will be following it with a TV camera in order to take some pictures of just how it looks. The Earth should be up here, so it ought to look nice against the uh, Earth background. This continues to spin, and at that point, we've done our job. The uh, automatic sequence will close the sun shield and so on, so our job is done. There's nothing more we can do. 
but we're very much interested in what continues to happen because the spacecraft contractors, the companies, S Satellite Business Systems and Telesat, are by no means there yet. At two minutes and five seconds, the Omni antenna here will deploy. We're going to look to see if we can see this, because if we can, that indicates the internal timer is working properly. It, it looks, it's tight. We may or may not be able to see it, because it'll be quite a ways away by then. And at 45 minutes later, the orbiter will have maneuvered to get the belly toward the uh, spacecraft. We should be over it and behind it a little bit. The perigee kick motor will light and we'll send it from roughly a 160 mile circular orbit to 160 by 23,000 mile orbit. Shortly after that happens, the, per the perigee motor is separated and it is now trash, although it is still in the same orbit. And this continues to spin. The apogee kick motor is within here and that will fire, I've forgotten exactly when, but I think it's after three uh, orbits of the 160 by 23,000. That will largely circularize it at 23,000, which is the geosynchronous altitude, and then it will phase to get on station. And along in there, the aft skirt gets deployed, which makes it twice as long, and the shelf up here, I forgot to mention earlier, gets despun. Remember, this part is spinning at 50 revolutions per minute. These are solar cells, which provide the power, and it is it thermally maintains its equilibrium by spinning so that no one side sees the sun all the time. And the antenna is then despun so that it points always at the Earth. The geosynchronous altitude will have it appear to be stationary over a spot. So this spins and it is ready to relay uh, its communication signals, which is its real intent. That's how this works. And at that point, our job is largely done with respect to the satellites except that just prior to entry, we will open the sun shields up again so that we'll close the doors over the top of it. And that, in a nutshell, is pretty much how the payload assist module uh, deployments will work. We'll do SBS on day one, Telesat on day two, and then we'll settle down to the rest of the mission, which includes on day four the EVA that Joe's going to bring you up to date on. Good morning. Uh, the last time we were together, there was talk of a possibility of an EVA, a spacewalk, and I'm very happy to report that uh, the possibility is uh, just about to become a reality. It's, it's uh, officially planned. It should take place on the fourth day of the mission. We haven't known about this for as long, though, so I really didn't have time to get a model ready as beautiful as Bill's. I do have a, a lesser one. But I don't uh, really think I need a model to talk about the EVA. It's, uh, as I mentioned, it will take place on the, on the fourth day, which uh, will be uh, a Sunday, fourth flight day, and uh, consists of essentially the following. Uh, we will get up at a normal time, have breakfast, and then uh, Bill and I will get into uh, spacesuits, uh, being assisted by, by Bob, who uh, will, for the rest of the day, be our flight director, Capcom, and... Uh, general mentor since uh, from time to time during the EVA we will be in contact with the ground but uh, most of the time will not be. We will for physiological reasons that aren't uh, completely clear at the moment uh, be required to pre-breathe in the suits, breathe the pure oxygen of the suits for three and a half hours there in the airlock, a time we hoped we'd be able to skip uh, by being clever with the uh, orbiter pressurization. Uh, it turns out we won't in this case, but I'm sure in the future we'll be able to. In any case, Bill and I will be in the airlock in spacesuits, pre-breathing for uh, several hours, and then uh, we'll close the inner hatch of the airlock, depressurize the airlock, check our spacesuits, and ultimately open the outer hatch of the airlock, which is on, on the, uh, the bulkhead there, the, the forward bulkhead over, of the orbiter, and go out into the payload bay for a spacewalk that should last about three and a half hours. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll be in the suits uh, a total of, of about uh, seven hours from beginning to end. The spacewalk itself is a fairly simple one. The main purpose, I, I should underscore, is really to test 
the systems of the orbiter that support an EVA in, up to and including the suits themselves. That is, is the, the main and really the sole reason for doing this, the EVA, the spacewalk. We have nothing that we need accomplish save to test these pieces of gear and uh, when they work we'll be pleased with that and so note if we have some problems with them we will also so note and uh, we'll have plenty of time to think about it make whatever fine changes or fine tune changes we need to the EVA gear for spacewalks that will occur later where missions do have to be uh, carried out properly and accomplished. The EVA itself, the part out in the payload bay, uh, consists of a number of, of tasks. We will, on going out through the, the airlock, translate from the forward bulkhead clear to the aft part of the orbiter, there by the, the big vertical stabilizer. And in fact, around the edges of the, of the sun shields, which will be closed, and there towards the back, and we can, we think, even disappear from view of uh, Bob and Vance uh, down behind the dedicated flight instrumentation at the back. It's our plan to do that and check communications from that uh, vantage point. We will then come forward in the payload bay to workstations that are positioned very close to the windows that look out over the payload bay but but down somewhat low so it will be difficult to see from the upper upper windows of the payload bay but we think will be very easy to see using television cameras that are placed out in the in the payload bay uh, and we will work at those workstations on uh, several tasks one is a force measuring task where Bill and I will both go through a protocol of uh, exercises, if you will, where we will literally measure what sorts of uh, forces we can exert in different directions as though we were workmen with tools trying to uh, unstick plumbing or uh, repair something. These are things that we have done already in the water immersion facility here, a, a 1G simulation of 0G, and the idea of this is to see if the zero-g experience is a, a good reproduction, or I should say is the water immersion facility experience a good reproduction of what's really happen happening in the space flight. If it is, we'll never need to make a measurement like this again. We can just uh, make the test that we, that we uh, that, or the measurements that we want to make in the water tank here. We are unsure, though, that the correlation is good, and that's the purpose of doing this force measurement task. <clears throat> There's another task to be carried out at the workstation. It's one that Bill will do, and it is going through the motions of changing out an electronics box, a box very similar to one aboard a spacecraft that's, in fact, already in orbit, and I'm sorry to report is broken. The idea being, if it's possible to replace electrical boxes like this uh, using a, a person in a suit out in the payload bay. It may uh, be just the sort of thing that uh, we will want to do in the future, and in fact we have, we have such a mission in mind that is being discussed right now, and that is the, the fixing of the solar maximum uh, mission satellite that is currently in orbit, a very good orbit, unfortunately it's broken as I say, and uh, we think it could be repaired. Bill will go through the motions to see if it might be possible to do this sort of thing. Uh, we're fairly confident it will, but uh, probably a good idea to try it before we actually set out on a, a mission where we want to, to fix something. I'll add that uh, the electrical wires he'll be working with are not connected to the 440 volts of the orbiter. They're really uh, uh, just uh, practice wires there. I will not do that task, but rather uh, will will view it using a television camera that's placed on the top of my helmet. Uh, I'm not not sure I'm comfortable in front of television cameras. I've often thought it might be fun to be to be behind one. I never thought I'd be underneath one, uh, but that's where I'll be during that time. The, the the camera sits up here, and when I turn my head, does not follow me, but when, if I turn my shoulders and helmet 
it should look pretty much where I'm looking. The purpose of this camera is not to give a panorama view of things going on. I don't uh, want there to be a misunderstanding, but rather it's to aid uh, the person in the suit by providing a view to people over, literally over, uh, over the shoulder that might be able to see something pers that the person in the suit would not be aware of and provide aid to a person working in the suit. So the camera, once again, doesn't look out in a, in a broad range, but looks down right in the area where the suited person would be working. It's, uh, in many ways, a space age uh, version of a miner's lantern, but it gives you more than light. It gives you the eyes and minds of uh, someone behind you. At the end of uh, the tasks at the workstation, there are a few shopping list items that we can uh, that we can choose from. Other tasks that we might want to carry out if we have time. It may be that we will not have time. Such things as using tools that are already aboard to close the payload bay doors if for some reason their motors fail, or to clamp them shut if for some reason their clamps fail. If we have time we will use those just to demonstrate that they can be used. Perhaps the most interesting tool, uh, one that uh, we've had a lot of experience uh, with probably 500 years, is a rope and a winch. Uh, it may sound peculiar. We think a device like that would be easy to use in zero G, but in zero gravity, exactly what a rope does, where it moves and how it moves around may prove to be uh, cantankerous, uh, even very difficult to use. So uh, rope management is the official title of that. We'll, we'll see how we do. It occurred to me earlier this morning that uh, in zero G it might even be possible to push a rope. Who knows? <laughs> uh, we try enough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a, a real quick run through some of the list of, uh, of things that, that we will be trying on the EVA. Once again, uh, let me emphasize that the uh, main part of the test, though, is just the working of the airlock and the suits themselves, none of the tasks that we do in particular. And let me also say that it is very much a team effort. Bill and I will be outside, but once again under the direction of Bob as uh, all this unfolds, and Vance is left alone to make sure that the orbiter systems continue to work properly and to run the whole store by himself. Uh, if the systems work uh, during the EVA as they have in the past, and we hope they will continue to, perhaps he'll have some time, though, to be the uh, official photographer and TV cameraman during that time. Uh, John, that's all I have. I'll go back to you. We'll entertain your questions here in Houston first and then subsequently at the other <coughs> centers. As soon as we get mics. Uh, right here, Jules, please. Jules Bergman, please wait for the mic. Two-part question. Uh, if you can't get the sun shields closed for reentry, is that a major problem? <clears throat> and second part, Joe, does the equipment you carry during EVA enable you to uh, close the payload bay doors if they are jammed? Yeah, let me answer the first part before Joe gets the second part. After the deployment with the, uh, the model gone there, we would then close the cargo bay doors as part of the deployment sequence to keep the sun out of the uh, support equipment that is still there. Then just prior to, to uh, entry, as you mentioned, Jules, we would open the sun shields prior to closing the cargo bay doors if there were a failure, which we think extremely unlikely, that prevented the sun shields from open, opening, we'd just ignore that and close the doors on top of it. Uh, we don't think that's any big deal. They might rub or scrape, but no damage is going to get done. There's no physical impingement. No. They'll be okay. Uh, you'd have to see the sun shield to understand that, but it's very thin wall aluminum tubing and a, uh, a thermal material on it. It's not like it was, it's not like it was metal here. It's, it's like, like a... Will An umbrella damage? is strong compared to this. Will it damage them? The, uh, the, the sun, sun shield, shield, maybe. The cargo bay door is definitely not. Is there more, Jules? Second part, your Joe. <clears throat> You're wondering Do you the carry is. the gear to close the cargo bay doors if they're hung up in the open position before reentry? Uh, Jules, the answer is yes. That gear's been aboard the orbiter since the first launch, in fact. Uh, our EVA is 
is a planned one. We've always had uh, there in our hip pocket the equipment necessary to do an unplanned contingency EVA to use that gear to close doors if necessary. That gear is there. But that would involve a second EVA. That is correct. And it's, it's a good point because uh, the orbiter has aborted the supplies and equipment to enable us to carry out numbers of EVA. So we bring the suits back in and we will recharge them, resupply them. That is part of the, of the test. And so we could go out a second time. Do you, during the, the planned EVA, attach the support ropes and winches and whatever else needed we, to the cargo bay no, doors? No, no. Simulating we, a, a, an emergency? No, we you don't. will not. We will attach them to attach points there just for that purpose. We will not go near equipment that's working properly. No, that isn't what I meant. Uh, obviously, I know you're not going to yeah. go near equipment that's working properly. What I meant was during your EVA, do you and Bill attach the rope and winches or whatever to the supports uh, of the cargo bay door simulating an emergency? No, we will not do that. We will attach them, though, to another support that happens not to be on the door. Roy Neal? Okay, this is for Vance and for Bob. And both of these are sequential questions. Can you describe for us what you'll be doing during auto land, number one? And then can you give us the camera plot, Bob? during the EVA. In other words, what would you be looking at? Where is your sun? What are the sun angles? And how would you be playing the cameras during the EVA? Auto land first. Okay, I'll catch the auto land and uh, Bob can catch the uh, EVA camera one. Uh, <coughs> it's not that we, we don't trust automatic systems, but we have a, a, a very uh, uh, well thought out method, we think, to uh, monitor auto land. Uh, especially from 10,000 feet on down, we'll have a, a three-man team effort. I'll be the guy that looks outside. Uh, if anything looks uh, funny, if the references we, we use on the ground don't look right, I have the option to take over uh, and uh, complete the landing manually. The Mr. Inside will be Bob. Bob will be monitoring airspeed, altitude, uh, and uh, things inside the cockpit to uh, make sure the trajectory is going right. He will be calling out <coughs> altitudes as we pass them, uh, and as we get close to the ground, calling out speeds, that sort of thing. Joe will be uh, Mr. Systems. He will be sitting, of course, in the third seat, which is uh, between Bob and myself, a little bit behind. He will be watching to make sure that all the health of the, the system stays up. For example, uh, in the unlikely event that a uh, an MLS uh, receiver should go, go out. Bob will, or Joe will call that out. <clears throat> and uh, in this, that particular case, we'd no-go the auto land, take over, land manually. So uh, we think uh, we're in a good position uh, by this means to keep an eye on it. Essentially, though, it's hands-off. That's, that's right. Uh, it's hands-off, of course. Uh, my, my hand is uh, right next to the stick, and uh, I have two means to take over. I can either uh, just grab the stick, and that automatically uh, gives me control, or press two buttons that are uh, in front, and uh, that, that also gives me control. Uh, Roy, on the second part of your question, uh, just one to amplify the first part a little bit. I will be watching our radar altimeter and airspeed and uh, trying very very difficultly, I must say, to try not to look up at all, and I'm just staring right at those instruments, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll never look up and see the landing until the vehicle is stopped. That's, uh, uh, that's uh, <laughs> well, that's one of the hardest parts of training for this particular landing, I guarantee it. Uh, it really is difficult, and for a, for a pilot used to flying, looking out the window, that is an extremely uh, difficult situation, but I, I feel it's important uh, because Vance has got to be looking out for what's unusual out there, ready to take over. And there are some cues we can get from the radar altimeter and the airspeed that is very important to Vance. And so that I, I consider that job important, although I sure wish I could look, look out. Your question on television cameras. Uh, let me just say, first of all, we're going to try to give the world the best possible tel television coverage we can of the EVA. Fortunately, the requirements for those cameras to help me as, as a controller of the EVA has the same goal in that I need the best possible pictures of what's happening in order to see, to, 
to uh, control or to act as a mission control in this case. Uh, during the translation back, we will be tracking them with camera <coughs> Alpha and Delta, the two forward cameras on the Longeron area, going back, and we'll probably pick them up with camera Bravo and Charlie back there as they get to the back end. When they go below, as, as uh, Joe mentioned, going below the DFI, we would expect to track them with the uh, two back cameras, Bravo and Charlie, looking down at them. So they really won't be out of our sight. They'll be out of our sight physically from the rear windows, but we should be able to track them with the camera. It gets a little bit more difficult when they get forward because the, um, in working the task simulation device, the workstation, the best camera to look at them is camera delta, which looks right down into their hands, uh, arms. And that might not be a very good shot from your standpoint, but I'll be able to see what they're doing. Camera alpha looking across gives us a little bit of a problem because we're, during this whole time we're going to be in a starboard sun attitude. So the sun is going to, when we're in daylight, the sun is going to be off that starboard wing. Now there should be some, some pretty spectacular pictures where we're going to try and get the earth just to see those looking the other way. But with the starboard sun, if we come up too high with that camera alpha, we're going to get washed out a lot with the sun. And there's, they're in playing the simulations now. There are times when I need to see what they're doing, and I really need that camera right to the very bitter edge of where it's usable in that sun. And so there is, I have some concern there uh, about that location, but we're working that out and just be aware that we do have basically a starboard sun attitude during that whole EVA. So there will be some concern of any of either cam any camera looking across the bay towards the starboard side. But we do need that sometimes for good, decent control of the EVA. Bruce Nichols from UPI, right behind you, Joyce. <coughs> Uh, one for Bill and then one for Joe. First, Bill, would you repeat again why it is that you create a potential problem by closing the sun shield after the, the two satellites are gone? And the second one for Joe, uh, when you're doing the tasks on that board, uh, exactly uh, why and how do you think it's different? Are you weaker uh, physically <laughs> in space or, or what? Let, 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 me, let me start with that one, Bill. <laughs> Uh, may be, may be stronger. However, uh, one thing's for, for sure, and that is there's no water. And uh, in, this, in this rather strange... Uh, Are you sure? Z I don't think. <laughs> uh, Zero-G simulation device we call the uh, water immersion facility here. Uh, you are uh, in a spacesuit, but in water, and the friction of the water is considerable. It's hard to tell how much where the spacesuit ends and the water stops. You can swim against it, though, even though you're in a suit. And um, in the case of, of applying forces, you literally apply forces. Uh, you partly hold yourself by using the viscosity of the water, and it's dubbed sub subconsciously, believe me, so it's also very unclear how that plays into the actual restraints. And when the water's removed, whether you're able to apply more force or less force. And we literally don't know. You'd think it would be possible to calculate that. It may be, but we're very suspicious of the calculations. On the, uh, on the sun shield doors, the after the deployment, the sun shield is closed, as I mentioned, to preserve the uh, equipment inside. And then what happens is if the cargo bay doors were to close, they should not touch the sun shield as it is. However, that's the static envelope. Now there's a dynamic envelope that's built up around things like the launch vibration, the launch loads, the nominal landing loads, the uh, whatever the fancy word for crash landing loads is. I don't think we use the word crash, but essentially the crash landing loads uh, enable both the cargo bay doors to jostle around and the, the payload inside to jostle around. With the sun shield closed like this, the uh, cargo bay doors and the sun shield have, they impinge upon one another's dynamic envelope, but not static envelope. So just to be doubly sure, since we don't need it with the doors closed, we open them and then close the cargo bay doors. If they failed close, we wouldn't give it five seconds thought. We'd just close the cargo bay doors and come home. What are you protecting in that? I the uh, other thing was gone. The avionics, the AVA. computer, the sequencer that uh, will be used again. This is all reusable. That's one of the advantages of the shuttle system is all of the stuff that we don't actually deploy, we'll bring back and use again. And one of our cradles actually flies again on Flight 7. Lynn Shear. 
Uh, I've got a couple. First, um, uh, Joe, who is looking at the output of your helmet camera? Is that Bob while you're doing it in real time? Uh, Bob and Vance will. They they can, can can select there in their own control room uh, any of the the five cameras that are outside, and for that matter, they have two cameras inside. They uh, through their selection can put one onto uh, a videotape recorder. So they literally call up which one of the, the five is recorded. And then when we're inside of the ground, though, AOS, the INCO and Mission Control could, if uh, we agreed to it, call up cameras using a remote system that uh, INCO has. Well, you said that the point of that camera was to give the worker, in this case Bill, some assistance while he's actually doing it. In other words, someone might say... Through a third person. Right. So okay, move, Lynn, move the screwdriver to the left a yeah, little bit? Yeah, Lynn, about? The, the camera was really designed uh, for the time when we have more complete communication coverage than we will on this mission. And very shortly we'll have that, where the ground can see 90% uh, of the time the orbiter's there. And uh, we literally could have a team of experts on the ground looking over a person's shoulder while said person works right here to try to fix something. And uh, that's, that's the design philosophy behind the camera. Okay. Uh, next question is, we were told yesterday that, Joe, I believe you're in the mid-deck uh, for liftoff and Bill for landing. Is that correct? Yes. Um, for you two, what will you do when you're in the mid-deck area for liftoff or landing? And for um, uh, Vance and Bob, is there a sense of taking a passenger in that regard? What, what, uh, how do you describe that relationship? Well, you let, me, let me usurp and even answer for them. I don't think there's that much of a sense of a passenger because you largely ignore him. <laughs> he's there. You're so busy doing other things, you just forget that he's there. And on entry, as you said, I will be in the mid-deck, and uh, as best as I can figure, uh, you heard Vance and Bob talk about the auto land and the monitoring and the very tricky nature of that. I guess my major job is I'm in charge of religious religious activities. During the <laughs> we we kid around a lot about the <coughs> the guy in the the mid deck. <coughs> we ask him if he'll put a blindfold on or uh, just uh, bury his head or just what he's going to do. So. Let's take one more question here in Houston, and then we'll try the Can others. From Joe on what he's going to be doing during liftoff. I can't improve on Bill's ascent. <laughs> I, I was asked what kind of a checklist uh, I would need for the ascent, and I, uh, my response was, could I have a security blanket instead? <laughs> uh, there's really nothing uh, to be done, although Bill and I, uh, not having uh, an active assignment during that, those times, have the luxury, I th think we'll be the first to have the luxury, reflecting upon what it's going to be like. I, uh, goodness knows, it, uh, the uh, people in the front seats uh, are overloaded with things they have to, to watch and even the person in the middle seat. But uh, down on the mid-deck, there's going to be some time to reflect on all that, and that should be both interesting and fun. Do you have a window? The question, is there a window? There is a very small window in, uh, in the hatch, and uh, we're thinking as to whether we want to open or close. <laughs> 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 Kind of John a blindfold Getter question, I guess. John Getter, and then we'll go to NASA headquarters in Washington. All of you have uh, spoken a great deal about technical training and buttons and dials and all that sort of thing, but for any or all of you, I'd like to know how you feel about this now that it's just a little over a month away. <clears throat> well, uh, er every guy has his own feelings. Uh, frankly, uh, we're very, very busy right now, and there, there's very little time to reflect. I have the feeling that uh, about one day before launch, all of a sudden, why, I'll say, my gosh, here it is. Uh, I, I, I'm uh, enthused and excited about the, the prospect, but uh, very busy right now, so little time to reflect. Bob, how about you? Well, I keep getting asked the question, am I getting excited? excited and I don't really know how to answer that. Uh, it's a culmination of 13 years of work here at Johnson Space Center for me. I certainly hope it's not my last flight, but it's a culmination of what I've been working for. So uh, in that sense, I guess I'm getting excited. Uh, 
again, the overwhelming technical aspects that we've been working with daily uh, for the very long hours seems to overwhelm or, or suppress any real true nervous type excitement at this point in time because there's always one more thing to do and one more thing to check. And uh, so I, uh, I guess I'm getting excited, but I really don't know what that means. I, I don't know what to add to that. The, uh, I can think several weeks ago when we went to the Cape for the first uh, of several of the tests that we've been to, here at Houston we get caught up in the training and it's day after day and you're, you're up to here and you can hardly catch your breath every now and then, which is how we get trained and it's good. You, you never have a chance to stand back and look at it. And I can remember driving onto the Cape the first day that we got there, Joe was with me, and at the Cape, they have these big billboards that they keep up to date. And it says, so many days until the STS, in this case, 5 launch. And I think it was 83 days. And we'd, it seemed like the day before, we'd been a year before launch. And here we are driving onto the Cape, and it says 83 days till the STS-5 launch. And I made the comment to Joe that, you know, my God, Joe, we're really going to go do this. And I think to a certain extent here, the training immerses you and keeps you away from thinking about that. But at this point, my major thought is that we're ready. Let's get on with it. Let's go do it. The only thing I add will add is uh, when we left yesterday, the sign said 37 days to launch. <laughs> <laughs> and there was only a week in between, it seemed like. <laughs> we'll take questions from the other centers on the audiovisual loop and then uh, return here in Houston. Let's go first to NASA headquarters in Washington. This is NASA headquarters in Washington. Uh, time to Washington Post. Uh, this is the first time a gang of four is going up. And I was wondering if uh, you guys had any special plans to stay out of each other's way. <laughs> uh, <coughs> gang of four, that's well put. <laughs> uh, Only Tom O'Toole would think of that. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, with the, uh, the old ejection seats in the cabin and the uh, special instrumentation and all, uh, I think it will be a little more crowded on this flight than uh, it will uh, be, say, on the next flight when uh, Challenger first flies without these things in the cabin. Uh, I think uh, we'll, we'll probably, uh, judging from my experience when I went up once before with uh, a three-man crew, we'll probably queue up at the water fountain and uh, uh, <coughs> when it's time to uh, see something on the ground, we'll all... Uh, getting each other's way, trying to get to the, the same window, that, that sort of thing. But uh, don't forget that uh, we, we do have more room in the cabin just because we are weightless uh, and, and we can, uh, we don't, we're not restricted to standing on the floor. We can float all around the room, so I don't expect too much trouble. I guess I would only add that uh, our commander is a, a wily veteran and I think he's going to keep us Four rookie, three rookies here under control pretty well. He does a pretty good job of keeping us under control here, and I think we'll, uh, he'll, he does a super job with us, and I think uh, he'll keep us under control, so I don't see any problem that, that, like that at all. I know he's assigned, Rob Navy he's assigned Bill and me to the airlock for some <laughs> That's right. With the That's failure it. of Ariane last month to deploy its communication satellites, do you all feel extra pressure that this is a supercritical mission in terms of deflecting competitive space dollars from the Europeans back to the United States space program? Uh, I wouldn't say that we feel extra special pressure. We're very much aware of that. As I said uh, last time we met, uh, we feel that we got the best game in town, and sitting doing a lot of uh, reflecting on that before the uh, mission I don't think is going to be very beneficial. I think over the next handful of uh, missions that that's going to be proven in spades. We're, we're very much aware of the uh, importance of this and we're training to get as smart as we can and we intend to do the very best job that we can and we're sure that's going to be good enough. Teresa Foley, Aerospace Daily. Uh, if um, you do go Autoland to touchdown, is the landing gear lowering controlled manually, or is that an Autoland function? And uh, what speed, altitude, and how many seconds before touchdown will that be lowered? Well, it is a manual function, uh, as it has been on the earlier flights. We will uh, drop the gear, specifically Bob will drop the gear at uh, 400 foot feet altitude, about uh, 270 knots. Uh, plus or minus a little bit, uh, depending on the trajectory. I don't know how many seconds that is before touchdown, but uh, not too many. 
it's uh, less, I don't know. Uh, we'd have to check. It, it's about 15 seconds. Incidentally, um, I uh, have another question. What, 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 what kind of um, oh. commentary will we get on the ground during the satellite deployments? You won't get very much because we don't have uh, real-time communications. For each of the deployments, we will have a, a ground station pass in the vicinity of 10 to 15 minutes before the deployment, and then not again until like 30 minutes after. So that the only kind of commentary you will get during that is when we can talk to the ground and there it will largely be a, uh, a very technical professional bringing the ground up to date in a very quick fashion that may be as simple as everything is nominal and we're going and we're proceeding and we'll be quite busy at that time. On the other extreme to bringing them up to date with the problems we have encountered, how we have solved them, whether we need any special help or whatever. But the communications just doesn't uh, lend itself to us giving you much of a running commentary of what's going on. We will be filming it and uh, recording it, as we said, for, uh, for later on in that day, we can dump the TV, and after the mission, we can look at the movies. But uh, that'll be about the size of it. Uh, Howard Benedict, AP. What are the sleeping arrangements for the flight? Do you have staggered sleeping hours, or are you all going to uh, sleep at the same time, and where will you bunk in? We're all going to sleep at the same time. Uh, we have not established any bunk locations. I think Vance and I probably will evaluate sleeping up in the ejection seats, strapping ourselves down there. Uh, basically, we're just all going to find a cubby hole where it's quietest and, and uh, we're most comfortable and uh, curl up in those areas, much as the uh, previous flights have done. We have not formalized any specific location for any particular crew member to try and sleep this we, time. Yeah, we have two sleeping bags for four crewmen. We had a weight scrub <laughs> earlier. <laughs> and. Uh, you don't really need a sleeping bag uh, very badly up there, so we'll probably flip a quarter or something when we get up there, see who gets a sleeping bag. Yeah, we are endeavoring to try and evaluate the sleeping bag. One of them is the old Apollo type, and one of them is a new shuttle-developed uh, sleeping bag, which would interface in particular at some future flight when they're going to go into uh, shifts into a sleep uh, sleeping bunk area. So we will try and evaluate that, at least one of us try it one night. but. I wouldn't be surprised if we come back and say all four of us just found a location over in the corner, much as Flight 3 and Flight 4 did, and went to sleep. And with Joe up there with his cameras, he'll probably get some pictures of some of us sleeping, I have a feeling. Might add that Joe's our official uh, photographer on this mission. Just a minute, we have one more question. This is Craig Caval at Aviation Week, and actually I got two flying questions for uh, just Vance question. and Bob, then a couple of EVA questions. Um, I'd like you to talk about your ascent margins for a minute. Are you showing good overlaps uh, on things like last RTLS and first to car capability, or are you a little more marginal in those areas than previous missions uh, if you'd end up with a sour engine or, or lose one late in the ascent? Well, I think uh, <clears throat> since Dakar is, is right on the, uh, the uh, orbital track that uh, we have good overlap uh, uh, w by using Dakar for the so-called transatlantic uh, abort, it, it uh, overlaps both the return to landing site area and the uh, proceed on to into orbit area. So I think we have good overlap there. Uh, see, was, I guess that answers the question. And on the, uh, on the landing, in auto land training, how significant uh, or any subtle differences you may be seeing between the STA and the, and the SMS and what you'd expect to see in the orbiter. Um, where I'm coming from there is really do you have any concern that as a result of those kind of subtleties you might see something in the orbiter on the way down that cause you to back out of auto land unnecessarily and then miss the DTO? Well, you've uh, put your finger on a, a point that uh, we've been looking at very carefully the last two or three weeks. We had some disagreement between uh, simulators. Uh, we consider the shuttle training airplane a simulator. It was landing a little fast. The uh, <coughs> shuttle mission simulator over here in Building 5 was landing a little slow. So uh, <coughs> uh, here at the Johnson Space Center, uh, pilots and engineers stood up and said, well, will the real landing trajectory stand up? Wh wh which is right, the, the fast or the slow? 
And uh, uh, so since that happened, uh, we've had a, a, a real strong effort, as Bob mentioned earlier, to resolve it. And I, I think we're getting there. And uh, yes, uh, by the time we fly, we feel that, that we will uh, know very well what the right trajectory is. And if we deviated from that, uh, or if the auto system deviated, we might take over. Craig, I would make one amplification to what you said on make, us making an error and causing us to back out of the DTO. Uh, if we're going to err in any direction, we want to err in that direction. We know how to land this vehicle in CSS. We know it can be done. And we know that that's a safe operational mode. And if we are going to make any error on judgment calls as we come down the pike on, on the auto land, and the, the error I want to make is on the safe side that says, Vance, I don't think we should go auto land because of what I'm seeing. You ought to take over and land it. I certainly don't want to suppress that and not make that call and have us make an autoland when we shouldn't have. There are a lot of flights coming down the road that we can always get an autoland DTO on. And so if we are going to err in any way, we want to make sure we come out of auto. If, if we have to make an error, just make sure that we come out of autoland and land at CSS and, and not push autoland to the point where it's something unsafe. So uh, we're not, I'm not going to lose any sleep. If I make a call to, to Vance that causes him to come out of autoland, to CSS, we make a successful landing, walk away from the spaceship, and then somebody says, gee, you were just on the ragged edge and you really could have let all land continue because, by golly, our biggest interest is getting the vehicle down on the ground safely in one piece and a good landing. And, and uh, so just like in any test procedure, we're, if we're going to err, we're going to err on the conservative side. Okay, and a couple for Bill and Joe. Uh about a month ago, you mentioned scrubbing down some of the tasks in the EVA, I, I believe primarily on the board. Did you ever actually uh, reduce those? And in the same category, I, again, about a month ago, there was some uh, discussion of maybe one of you going all the way out onto the door as if you'd be carrying a rope out. And I understand that's been deep sixed as well. You might speak to why that uh, never went further than it did. Craig, let, let me talk about the the uh, tasks at the board, that they consist of uh, filling in numbers on a fairly large matrix. And when we talked last, we had gone through the procedure of filling in each number. Uh, to answer your question, yes, we won't fill in that entire matrix. Uh, we'll do representative things so that it won't take quite so long. So we have looked closely at it, and I think we have a very good balance. I've arrived at a good balance. And on the other question, we did have in the back of our mind and in our one of our tasks, the uh, idea that I would take the end of the winch out to the tip of the cargo bay door and either connect it to where we would connect it if we had to winch it in or verify that I could or whatever. And there's a lot of people that are fairly nervous about that for reasons that I don't really understand, but I don't think that's a significant omission. And with some, some of the cargo bay door funnies that we've had on the last couple of missions, Frankly, I'm just as happy to stay away from the door in the event that we see anything that's due to thermal. I don't want to have touched the door. Uh, Leonard David with Space World Magazine. I guess for William Lenore, does your practice of solar max repair qualify you for a possible uh, later mission to actually do the project? I'd appreciate it if you'd uh, suggest that to my boss. <laughs> uh, I, I'm sure it does, but on the other hand, I'd have to be the first to admit that uh, it's really not that complicated. It's not that difficult. I mean, any, anybody can put a wrench on a nut and back it out, and once you've done one of them, doing another 18 of them isn't all that tough, so that we've got an office full of people that would be just as qualified. Thong Duc Trang, Vietnamese Service, Voice of America. Uh, you described to us the way the uh, satellites will be deployed from the PAM, and we know that the mechanical arm, which is not on board this time, will be one means of uh, deploying things. So what is the difference between using one of the two means to deploy? And we know that the satellites uh, weigh about 8,000 pounds each, so is weight one of the consideration for the means of deployment? Let, let me try that. The, I think the consideration is really one of simplicity. The arm is complicated and can do complicated things. The deployment of a spinning satellite, though, is basically very simple. It's, a, it's symmetrical. It's on a rotating table, 
and all we need to do is to deploy it is to no longer hold it down. Uh, it would be possible to use an arm, but it would just be very complicated, and we've gone the, the simplest uh, route we know. Yep. Because of the spinning nature of it, the, an interface with a stationary arm would be very difficult and complicated. And one of the beauties of the payload assist module uh, system is that it is so simple, it, it almost borders on being what you would call stupid, but that's, that's its, real, uh, its real benefit is it is so simple that there really are not very many failure modes. Headquarters has no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Now to uh, Kennedy Space Center, Florida. Uh, this is the Kennedy Space Center. We have several questions. The first from Peter Adams from Today Newspaper. Yes, sir. For uh, doctors uh, Lenore and Allen, uh, have either one of you or both of you uh, discussed your EVA plans with previous astronauts who've done EVAs? And if so, which astronauts and uh, what kind of advice? The answer is yes with uh, many of them. And uh, uh, we've gotten all kinds of advice and good help. I think uh, we have here at the Johnson Space Center the aggregate knowledge of, of doing EVAs, and I, I hope that uh, Bill and I can benefit from that knowledge and use it. Yes, I, I agree with Joe, and some of the specific people that we have talked to, remember we did a lot of EVAs on Skylab, where we had planned EVAs and we had contingency EVAs that were out to save various parts of the spacecraft or uh, parts of experiment. And we've talked at length with uh, Paul Weitz and Jack Lausman and Owen Garriott and the people that have done the uh, Skylab EVAs. Hey, Gary Balanoff from Channel 6. Uh, for either Bill or Joe, uh, kind of a question to clear up some misunderstanding. I believe yesterday in one of the briefings, somebody said that uh, the EVA suits uh, should not be used for longer than six hours was the time frame they were using. Uh, and I believe uh, Joe was saying something about you'd be in, in the suit for a total of seven and a half hours at a time. Is that, is that what I'm hearing or not? Well, uh, the use of the suit, uh, we monitor as we go on. It has so much oxygen, so much uh, other consumables, and it keeps track of how much is left in a very clever and neat way. And if uh, a person in a suit were, were to go very quietly and not, uh, not do much work, not breathe a lot, could stay there for quite a long time. Yeah. The, uh, the, limiting, uh, the limiting consumable is the... Uh is the lithium hydroxide that scrubs the uh, carbon dioxide out of the uh, air that you exhale. And I think that's where the six-hour number has come from, and we need to get a better number, which is one of the things our flight will do. But I believe the spec on that was six hours useful, which threw in another hour for pad just to have some margin, so that they had to build it to provide seven hours once you're in the suit. And I, I believe, in fact, in test, it's been coming out closer to 11. So that that would appear to be our more nearly what our real consumable limit is if it's a CO2 scrubbing. And our mission should get us some definitive numbers on this in the real EVA environment to, to, to know for better planning in the future. I would also like to add one point to that where the uh, misunderstanding may have come is uh, you must remember that Joe and Bill will be on the umbilicals for the three-hour pre-breathe. So the only consumable that will be being used during that time will be the lithium hydroxide. We have recently trained, and I am, I think, trained to go in, and uh, during the pre-breathe, if there's a significant CO2 change, or if the pre-breathe is longer, to go out and change out the lithium hydroxide canisters on their back, and I can do this without breaking their pre-breathe so that they will not get any nitrogen, and uh, that would then give them, from that moment on, seven more hours, or 11 hours, as Bill said, of lithium hydroxide. So uh, you, you've got to remember two things. One, that the three-hour pre-breathe occurs that they are on the umbilical to the spacecraft, which means their, their cool water cooling system and their uh, electrical power is being taken from the spacecraft, so they're not using any of that consumable. And then their, their uh, lithium hydroxide is the only consumable being used, and we can uh, go ahead and change that out if necessary. Uh, Peter Larson from the Orlando Sentinel. A question for uh, Joe and for Bill. What's the actual number of hours you've practiced the solar max repairs in the ocean tank? 
And also, spending seven hours in a, a cooped up in those suits, is that a claustrophobic feeling? Uh, has any American astronaut ever been in a space suit that long? Uh, by comparison with earlier EVAs, this is not a long EVA at all. And many people have been in suits much longer. And to, uh, with regard to claustrophobia, it has a big bubble helmet so you can look out beautifully. Gene Cernan's here. He's probably been in a suit longer. Yeah, Peter Adams from today. Yes, in, uh, in ascent, uh, will you be able to observe the uh, solid rocket booster separation and will there be any uh, observation to uh, determine if there are any failures in the uh, uh, deacceleration system? Uh, reports from uh, crewmen that have already flown the Space Shuttle Columbia uh, are that you may uh, notice a flash. Uh, that's about it. Uh, you, you just, uh, there, there's a light flash when uh, separation rockets uh, come on. Uh, we have indications in the cockpit when the uh, SRBs leave. Uh, other than that, it's uh, better seen from the ground, probably. There's no uh, Peter Larson from the Sentinel again. Pardon? He's worried about seeing the Yeah, I'd asked uh, how many hours you actually no. practiced in the immersion tanks on the solar max repairs. Uh, I don't think I got an answer. Okay, sorry about that. We, uh, we skipped that one. Total hours that we've spent practicing on the solar max tasks are, I would say, uh, in the vicinity, this is in the water, in the vicinity of five or six hours, which is like five or six runs through it, which is ample. We have two more coming up. One will be next week, and then the final one will be, I believe, a few weeks before liftoff. Uh, one final question. Uh, you won't be sleeping in shifts. Will you have to eat in uh, shifts? We don't think so. We're scheduled to eat simultaneously. Uh, I think the main thing that might drive us to eating in shifts is if we get so busy, we're trying to eat <coughs> in a run, uh, which is not, uh, not all that atypical from the way we work around here. But we're scheduled to eat simultaneously, and there ought to be more than enough room and uh, ample opportunity to do that. We don't want to uh, sleep in shifts where we don't yet have a uh, real secluded place uh, with regard to sleeping quarters, we're afraid if one guy stays up and is banging around, he'll keep everybody else awake. So. Hey, uh, Bruno Stanek from Swiss TV. A question probably for Dr. Lenoir. While you are spinning up payload and stages, do you think you will have any forces acting on the orbiter which your reaction control system has to compensate? We, we have thought about that, and the, the answer is obviously yes, there will be some uh, reaction torques that the uh, orbiter's control system will have to take out just from the spinning up, and that angular momentum will have to be counteracted by an opposite torque on the orbiter that can only come from the reaction jet system. Uh, every time we've asked, we've been told it is so small that uh, we may or may not even be able to notice a discrete firing of the vernier system, the small control system, and be able to blame it specifically on that. I've never done the numbers out myself. I'm surprised it's that small. But the answer is it should be down in the noise, essentially. Okay, that's all of the questions from KSC. Thank you. Marshall? This is Marshall Space Flight Center. We do have questions. We'll start with Dave Dooling of the Huntsville Times. Uh, for, for Joe Allen and Bill Lenore, how many uh, sims have you done in the wet F? Uh, Dave, uh, you're going to embarrass. We don't remember exactly. I, I would guess about 10 by the time we fly. Uh, and those range in length from 2 to, to uh, th wow. uh, 2 hours to 4 hours long. So we've spent uh, quite a number of hours in uh, the water immersion facilities. Yesterday, yesterday, uh, Terry Neal said there's no telling what Joe Allen will do during the EVA. And this was in reference to uh, uh, standing up a bit to look over the sill towards the wing with the, uh, with the camera or even looking at the material sample on top of the DFI. Uh, do you have any quick look-see things that you're contemplating doing that aren't necessarily in the timeline? I don't know anybody named Terry Neal. <laughs> uh, he used to work here. <laughs> Dave, I think one of the uh, objectives is uh, to see how this, the suits work, including uh, the camera on top. And uh, 
we'll try to get a very good idea of how it how it does work looking in the payload bay and then at the orbiter and then also uh, elsewhere. Yeah, one comment to amplify on both that and the previous question is remember the intent of the EVA and the purpose and we have an awful lot of latitude to make the observations and to do the tasks, steps, procedures, whatever that we feel in real time are necessary in order to evaluate the system. So that uh, whatever either of us do that may or may not be written into the uh, checklist step by step is still expected and that's part of our job is to get out in that environment, decide what is the most important thing to do and to do it. And as far as the WIF training, one difference here from previous EVAs the particular timelining and the tight tuning of the tasks is unimportant and we have specifically stayed away from it. How fast we do a given task is not important. That we be able to do it is. It takes a lot less training to know how to do a task than it does to whittle it down from 45 minutes to 42 minutes, for example. So that uh, we're ready, training-wise. We've got two more that are just going to let us go through it to make sure that we've seen it again from end to end. But the uh, the tight timing of it is not important, and in real time, if we see something that looks like a better way to do something than we thought pre-flight, we're free to do it. And uh, finally, do you know if an EVA has been scheduled for STS-6, and if so, will they be expanding on the activities that you do and learn on STS-5? We, I don't know the answer I to believe that. the we, answer is no. We don't think so. It's, it's a fairly short mission yes. to begin with, but uh, we're not right, the right guys to answer that. Jim Adamson, Channel 31 in Huntsville. Uh, my question first to Joe and Bill. Uh, they weren't quite sure yesterday. What do you plan on doing for that three and a half hours uh, in the suits before you go EVA? Uh, any plans for that time? Well, we had a uh, an altitude chamber run last week, and uh, one at a time. Joe uh, went, I believe, on a Tuesday, and I went on a Friday. And what I did during my pre-breathe, we went through the whole flight protocol, which included three and a half hours in the suit, which in 1G is a lot tougher than it would be in 0G. I did two hours worth of paperwork in the suit. We discussed and reviewed a couple of checklists. And then I got an hour's worth of much-needed sleep before we pressed on. My guess is in flight we're going to do the same thing. We'll spend some time boresighting Joe's TV camera, which is probably an inefficient way to do it. But heck, we've got three and a half hours anyway. And then I intend to get a nap. Vance has said something about getting the uh, f the mission report written during part of that time. <laughs> I have one more question then for either Vance or Bob then. The maximum braking maneuver uh, on touchdown, is that looking towards uh, landing at Kennedy in future missions and uh, is that going to be present any problems? Do you think it will go as planned then? Well, obviously, anything, uh, any testing we do on any of this landing is uh, looking forward to a, a, a operational spacecraft and landing it wherever we're directed to land without any concerns. Uh, it just, it might even be more looking towards a potential someday landing at a contingency landing site with its shorter runways. Uh, I don't see any problems with it at all. Uh, we expect to, to see the anti-skid system cycle during that uh, uh, test, and we uh, we just expect to see it to go pretty much as we see it in the simulator right now. Did I leave anything else? That's right. I think it's keyed to uh, runway landings and, as you said, shorter runways. There are no further questions at Marshall. Thank you. Thank you. Back here in Houston, Jules Bergman, please. This is for Vance Brand and probably Bill Lenore. I know it's unlikely, <clears throat> but if the spin-up mechanism fails for either satellite, will you and can you manually release them or will you bring the payloads back down to Earth? The answer to both questions is yes. If the spin-up mechanism fails, or if it doesn't for that matter, we do have the capability to, as we call it, jettison the payload. So we have the capability. But if the only thing that happened is the spin mechanism has failed, then we would button it up and bring it back, get that fixed, and have that fly on some later day. Even though there are hot rockets aboard, hot solids? Yeah, they're. they're they're no more hot than they were when we lifted off, though. There are two solid rocket engines in here, and each one of them's got uh, three or four inhibits in series, all of which would have to be enabled. A final question. Does jettisoning uh, mean that just that, 
or will they still work? Now, when, when I use the word jettison, I mean that we cannot deploy it and have it still work, and it is considered dangerous to bring back, so we would jettison it. And as best as I know, in our flight rules reviews, we have identified no credible pair of failures that uh, lead us to jettison a spacecraft. Fuel is just one application. If, you, if that thing isn't spinning it for its spin stability, it doesn't have enough gas to do it on its own, so it's not a usable spacecraft if it's not spinning. That, you can check that with Hughes, but that's... Uh, well, perhaps you know the answer then, Bob. My next question is, how high does the spin-up and the spring, re spring release mechanism get it before the uh, perigee motor fires? In other words, how far away does it get on its own from the uh, shuttle? About 12 and a half miles no, right not now. on its own. We do a well, set maneuver. Yeah. From the set maneuver. Yeah. We yeah. Do about a set three maneuver. miles, I believe, three or four miles, if we did not do it's a set spin maneuver. Spin up and spring yes. alone. At the, yes. at the instant of spin but, up, the spin up has nothing to do with it. The spring release has it, and at the instant of spring release, it's about two feet per second. Yeah, it's about two and a half to 2.8 feet per second. And what you have is we, it doesn't fire for 45 minutes, and that two and a half feet per second puts it in a slightly different orbit. 45 minutes is half an orbit, and that's how far it's gotten away. Spin up is just for stability. The actual physical distance separation is, is the springs. Is that's the right. springs. That's right. That's kind of what I meant. And I, I hate to see the papers when I use the word stupid. Is it really doesn't have an active attitude control system? It is spin stabilized. It doesn't require any brains, any inertial sensing. It just sits there and spins and gets its stability through that. Let, let me clarify one thing, though. Uh, we have the, the natural separation rate that, that comes from the springs, which uh, somebody mentioned was two to three feet per second. Uh, no, I don't think we've mentioned here today that after we deploy, 15 minutes uh, afterwards, we have uh, an ohms burn, and we burn 16 feet per second, which uh, makes us separate from the satellite even faster. So if we never got that ohms burn off for some reason, we're still safe. Uh, we would, uh, after 45 minutes, when the perigee burn happens, we would uh, be three or four miles away in a safe position. If we get the ohms burn off as planned, and it's virtually assured, we'll be 12 to 13 miles away. In any case, no sweat. No sweat. Laszlo Dozier, Voice of America. That's what Joe and Bill, in an emergency, could you two fly the vehicle back to the ground? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. We'd just put it on auto. We're confident. Speak for yourself. <laughs> but uh, we're in good hands, and uh, there's no emergency that uh, uh, I could conceive of that uh, where we'd have to do that. But have you been trained for it? In yes, we, we have trained for it. We're not proficient at it, and uh, we know how to do it, but we've not practiced doing it over uh, many months, as have Vance and Bob. I'm going to take two more we, questions before we wrap they, up. They have good capability to fill in as a, uh, in an emergency as a crewman in the, the front. Uh, they, they've done simulation. They haven't done 100% of the simulation, but they're well trained. Two final questions, those from Ed DeLong and then Mark Kramer. Uh, Ed, uh, Joyce, right behind you to your right, left. If you couldn't get rid of one or both of the satellites, would that put any constraints on your EVA, where you could go, what you could do? No. Even though there'd be solids back there then? Well, we, we have no intention of getting into the bowels of this thing anyway, and getting around it is, I mean, if that thing were to light off, which is impossible, it, we would not be in no worse a condition being next to it than we would by being in the cabin. It would, either way, it's going to ruin our day. <laughs> and, and there'd be I, no I, worry that you might do something that would cause it to light off if, you know. What, what might scrub the EVA is if we have some problem getting the PAMs off, we might say, well, we won't try to get, get it off on day one or two. We'll try on day three or day four even. And, uh, of course, then that would impact the EVA timeline. Time Okay, and uh, for you, Vance, I guess, what are the probabilities that you're going to be able to get off in that seven-minute window that allows you to launch SBS-1 the first day? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, in November at the Cape, uh, we can't have ground fog, and uh, so I think that, that's a major concern. Uh, it would be uh, some, some weather problem. 
early in the morning, you know, we're, we're going uh, uh, less than an hour after sunup. So I think we'll be watching the, the weather closely. We're hoping, though, that uh, even at this time that we can open up that launch window just a little bit. Uh, I know people are trying to get it larger. And, and if we don't, of course, uh, get off in that uh, six or seven minutes, but we can get off in 37 minutes, that only says that uh, we don't. We, we have to wait till the second day to deploy the first PAM. So, in a way, we have a 37-minute window right now. Mark, uh, I guess this is for uh, Dr. Lenore. Th here's a question about uh, the satellite deployment. I have a couple on EVA. I think you said that uh, you would shoot some video of the uh, deployment of the satellites and dump it to the ground later. W yesterday, we heard there'd be no TV dump. So, which is it? <laughs> Well, we're going to take the TV and have it on board, and the dump is under their command. We've done our part. I was under the impression we were going to dump it later, but if they say they don't have the passes for it, they know a lot more than I do. The, an the answer uh, is we do have the pass for it on the first deploy. The second deploy gets a bit more complicated. We will plan to dump it. It may be as late as 12 hours later, which uh, from your point of view is not... Uh, not so neat. It's, it might be possible to sandwich it in okay, and, and, and get it uh, 40 minutes later, 30 minutes later. Okay, and regarding the EVA, I'm still not clear on what the real answer is to as uh, is regarding whether you folks will go outside the payload bay. I, I know what you said. Well, it's it, a real-time decision. It, it depends on, on where inside stops and outside begins. Uh, we will move along handholds and slide wires, and uh, they're connected, uh, they're there in the payload bay. We do not have maneuvering equipment per se that would enable us to, say, float way above the orbiter or something like that. However, the payload bay uh, has sills and then, uh, and then uh, bulkheads that come way up, so the up-down motion that we should uh, be able to get should be significant. Well, specifically, have you thought about Climbing up the aft bulkhead and looking at the Ohm's engines or, or climbing we, out over we on can, the wing? Uh, we can certainly climb up the bulkhead and peer over at the Ohm's. Between us and the Ohm's engine, though, is just tile. It's fairly fragile. We're interested in that tile staying as healthy as we find it, and it's not our intent to go along it, nor would it be easy to do. Okay, and Dr. Allen, final question. Uh, you alluded to the physiological problems uh, regarding the change in pre breathing. Can you talk about uh, what the uh, experts tell you may be going on. We heard yesterday methodology problem in the testing here, but it's fairly significant if all the subjects come, or 30 percent of the subjects in both cases come down with the bends. Uh, they do? What, well, <laughs> the report I heard was 30 percent with the uh, lowered uh, cabin pressure and 30 percent with the three hours of oxygen pre-breathing. It's, uh, I'm the wrong person to ask. Uh, I'll say I'm not sure there are experts in this field. I used to think so. I'm beginning to wonder. Uh, Bill and I follow a procedure that we know works very well for us. Indeed, it's worked for many people in the past. I might say uh, it, it, it perhaps is not uh, immediately obvious uh, to some of your readers and viewers that there is a real difference between the shuttle and past spacecraft in that we live in a normal atmosphere in the shuttle. And past spacecraft, uh, the astronauts have always been in a pure oxygen atmosphere for many hours before an EVA has happened. And so in, in the past, an EVA has taken place and there has never been a discussion about pre-breathe. Pre-breathe, of course, is getting the nitrogen out of the bloodstream. Pre-breathe is something that uh, concerns people, uh, divers, for example. Scuba divers know about it. But it's a little new to the space business because of the n normal atmosphere we have in the orbiter. Uh, we thought we had a procedure that would work fine and would save tedious hours, overhead hours, enable us to get in a suit, pre-breathe for just a short time, and then go out. That procedure did not work as we had projected, and so we're going back to the plan A, which is rather cumbersome. Uh, there will be procedures developed in the future, I'm sure, that will work uh, more rapidly, more easily than the one Bill and I will do. Uh, I don't say that by way of apology. I just say that the one thing we won't be testing is the physiological procedure to improve on pre-breathe times. We're going to be testing equipment, and we're going to be using a procedure that we've used many times prior to going in the altitude chamber, and we know works fine.
Yeah, that's the one thing that I'd like to emphasize is that last week both Joe and I individually have gone through the very pre-brief protocol and then been taken in an altitude chamber to a hard vacuum outside and neither of us uh, experienced any adverse physiological symptoms at all. And the thing that's happening with the tests is that apparently the current feeling is that it's blamed on the exercise protocol, not the pre-breathe protocol, and the exercise puts unrealistic stress on a particular joint, mainly the knee, that then experiences the, uh, the bends. And if that is unreal and not like anything that we do in flight, that has caused us to fall back to our old tried and true procedure that we know works. Even it didn't work in the test, but we know from experience that it does work in the real sense. I have a feeling, and many others do also, that the previous procedure of uh, decreasing the cabin and so on will in fact turn out to be okay also when we sort out all of the funnies. And on that note, we end this morning's session with our thanks for your time and attention. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you.